Good morning. Thank you for being with us for this 9 o'clock worship service this morning. If you look around and see some empty pews, uh, I should note that it is church camp week. So uh, we have campers off uh, worshiping, um, is it Naoti? Okay, yeah. you can tell I don't have a uh, camp age camper anymore. My kids are grown up. Um, uh, so they're off at Naoti worshiping this morning, and that's, uh, I know, will be a great week for them, and uh, lots of fun and a lot of uh, spiritual uh, maturing this week as they're uh, together as a group. Um, if you haven't filled out an attendance card, I encourage you to, to do that now, pass it to the, any, any aisle nearby. We'll have some gentlemen pick those up in just, just a few moments. Um, if you'd like to, let's stand as we sing our first song this morning. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor and girded What tongue can recite? It breathes in the air. It shines in the light. It streams from the hills. It descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and Bow with me, please. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to be here. We're thankful that we can gather with people of like faith to worship you this morning, to lift you up in song and in scripture and in word. And Father, we pray as we do this today that you bless us with a true passion for worshiping you that you remove worldly distractions, Father, and that you help us to focus upon who you are, what you have done for us, and truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Give us a good service today. Bless our singing. Bless the one who brings the word to us, Father. Give us hearts ready to receive your word and your will this week. And Father, this week as we depart from this place after today, help us to do your will each and every day that we have opportunity to do it. Give us these opportunities this week and help us to bless others for your sake as we try each day to honor you. Father, be with those who are at camp today. Uh, be with those who are away from us uh, for, for whatever reason uh, that, that might be. Father, we have those in our congregation who are hurting because of illnesses that are beyond their control. We have friends who have lost loved ones and people who have passed of recent, uh, recently this morning. We just pray, Father, that you reach out in each one of these situations and that your hand guides those round about them for comfort and peace and healing and mercy. And Father, help us this week to, to take a moment to think of others, um, to send a kind word to someone else to do your will as we progress this week. Father, we especially pray now for energy and for resolve, for spreading your word from this place. Bless those things that are going on here, Father, but bless them with a renewed spirit for energy for your kingdom, for reaching the lost 
and for doing your will. Father, if we feel tired, Father, lift us up. If we feel apathetic, Father, challenge us. And Father, give us those things that we need to draw closer to you. Father, we know that we are poor sinners. That's what we are. We're thankful that you hear our prayer despite that through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for his life, for the example that it gives to us that a servant's heart is the heart that we should have. Father, we know that we will make mistakes along that journey. And Father, we pray for your forgiveness for those mistakes that we make, especially those that we make knowingly, but all that we make, Father. Intercede for us. Abba, Father, help us be the people that we need to be for you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Worthy, you are worthy, King of kings, Lord of lords, you are Holy God, to whom 
this morning to help us prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, uh, I picked a couple of verses to read, and they're short little passages. One is in the book of John, and one is in the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. So John chapter 3, uh, this is a passage you've probably committed to memory, but I wanted to read John 3, verses 16 and 17. I think 17 is, is just as important as verse 16, really. Um, Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. And another passage over in 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. 1 John 4, 9, beginning... In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So this morning, as we partake of this Lord's Supper, as we eat the bread, as we drink the cup, let us remember what he did for us, that he did Love us enough. He loved me enough. You can put your own name in the blank there. He loved you enough that he would come to this earth, give his life as a payment price, the perfect payment uh, for our sins that we could never bring about on our own. He did that for us. So at this time, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much this morning as we come before your presence, as we at this time, take this bread, Father, and as we partake of this bread, help us to remember and to think back on what you did for us and the, the great love that you had before time even began. You knew what you were going to do. And you loved us in giving your son for the world, but you loved us individually. And we know, Father, that uh, as Paul said, you loved me and gave yourself for me. And Father, as we partake of this bread, help us to remember and reflect on your great love for us. And as we partake of this, help us to do it in a way that brings honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
first part of John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. Let's go to God again in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning realizing what love is and that you loved us enough, the Father enough to give you and you enough to come of your own will and die for us on this, uh, for our sins, be the payment price, the propitiation. Father, this morning as we take of this cup, we remember and we reflect on that great gift that you've given us. And Father, we, we're thankful for the, your life, for your, the blood that was shed. And I'm sure we don't completely understand it, but we marvel at the, the power of it and the hope that it gives us. And we remember the great payment, the great sacrifice that he made on our behalf. Father, as we take this, this morning, help us to remember, reflect, and, and to enjoy and praise you in the hope that it gives us at this time. May we partake of this in a way that brings great honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, at this time of our worship, we're mindful of not only your love for us, but how you bless us in so many ways, Father. We thank you for this, these blessings in our lives, and we pray that we would be good stewards of these. We're thankful right now for the opportunity to go back and portion these blessings to you, and we pray that we do so in a manner well-pleasing to you. Christ, let me pray. Amen.
like you let's stand for our next song. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and shattered our night. Hallelujah, thy glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that church. It is good to see everyone this morning. That sounded great, given as many people as we have at camp. You guys sounded great this morning, just uh, very present and with it this morning. Uh, it was good to see a number of guests this morning. We have a number of guests with us, both longtime friends and uh, maybe some, some first timers with us this morning. I'm glad to have you. Hope you'll stick around following our worship this morning for a Bible class. We've got several good ones. Uh, those are on the back of the program that are in the, that's in the windows and in the back of the auditorium. If you didn't get one, that's available online uh, each week. Um, or, or just follow somebody who looks like they know where they're going. Uh, more than likely, they're going to one of our good Bible classes. Uh, it was good to see Ricky and Joe this morning. They are back safely from Honduras and I asked Ricky if he had a word or two to share about his experience. He said, well, he preached three times last week, and he thinks he's worded out. Now, I don't believe that. I don't believe that one minute, do you? <laughs> um, but uh, I, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll share. He and Joe will share. I know the work is going well down there. There have been a lot of difficulties with this season of COVID, but the, the work of the church is, is strong there. Uh, William and Jacqueline are doing well, and so um, we are mindful of them, uh, especially. Ricardo, was Ricardo better? He was sick last week, you said? Okay, very good. So we need to continue to remember them, uh, the, church, the churches um, in Honduras. Um, and, and as Mark mentioned, a number of folks are at camp, and we do miss them this morning. My wife is there. She said she had 19 little girls surrounded her the other night, and so that's a little different. That's a little different from the way it is at our house, so she's getting a good experience there. I want to start this morning with the word of the Lord from Haggai. If you want to turn to Haggai chapter 1, or I'm going to put it on the screen here, and then we'll pray and get into our message. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house, to be built. And the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? And this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse 
with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. That's a sobering message to start with this morning, isn't it? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for all these blessings that have been named already this morning. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come together as your people in worship to lift you up. I thank you for this, these songs of praise and the words that so powerfully express our devotion and our commitment to you. Father, may those words that we sing be honest reflections of what's in our heart this morning. And Father, as we consider these words from your prophet and we dig into the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, Father, may you restore your people again. Father, revive us again uh, as you did in the days of old. And Father, we, we're thankful for all those who uh, you've assembled here this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I, I, I told you a few weeks ago, Celeste and I celebrated our 26th anniversary this month, July 1st. Can you believe 26. She's a saint, isn't she? Um, uh, we, we got away a couple of weeks ago and spent a couple of days in Chattanooga just to kind of get away uh, for, a, for a couple of days, and we had a great time. Stayed at a really, really neat little bed and breakfast in East Brainerd. If you're ever uh, in Chattanooga need a place to stay, I'd love to talk to you about it. There's a wonderful, neat little place. And uh, we had a good time, but you know the, the old phrase, you can't go home again? You know, maybe you've heard that. So we kind of drove around town reminiscing. If you don't know, I, I grew up in Chattanooga. I was born and raised there. After we got married, uh, we moved back there and spent the first six and a half, almost seven years of our married life in Chattanooga. Andy was born there. and just uh, So in a lot of ways, that's home to me. It's home to me. So we drove around kind of reminiscing, you know, but, but it just felt weird. It was just weird. It's been 20 years since we moved, almost. And so you just imagine uh, the number of things that have changed. And, and as I said, it was weird. We drove past our old house, and it was kind of heartbreaking that the trees we loved in the front yard were gone. Uh, the new owners ha had painted it a color that just we would never have picked, you know. Uh, it just didn't quite fit. Um, the neighborhood not far away where a lot of our students, I was youth minister, uh, a lot of our students lived, uh, was hit by the tornado last year. So there was just devastation I, that I, uh, uh, still a year later. Um, and so that was very, that was very strange. The, of course, I've told you before, the church where we, that we were a part of is, the church building at least, is now a funeral home. And um, just a lot of things have changed um, my, my, most of our friends have moved, uh, my parents have moved, and so, you know, it just wasn't the same. It's hard, it's hard to return home. Now, I can't imagine what it would have been like for the Jews who returned to Jerusalem in Judea after their exile. So last week, we started off this series, Restoring a People, and and I told you, we want to dig into the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. I believe God still is at work restoring His people. And to get some guidance for how, how uh, He can restore His people, He will restore His people today, I want us to return to that 6th century B.C. Prof, uh, time of Ezra and Nehemiah, to this time uh, where God brought His people back home from exile to rebuild the city, city of Jerusalem, its walls, the temple, and, and to restore His people back to where He desired for them to be. And, I, and as I said, I think God is constantly at work restoring His people, and that makes this story as relevant today as the day it was written. The story Ezra and Nehemiah is really one story. For centuries it was regarded as one book. We talked about that a little bit last week. And Ezra chapter 1, turn in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 1, tells us that God moved in the heart of a pagan king, King Cyrus of Persia, not only to allow the captives to return home after 70 years, but he also sent along with them the treasures that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen out of the temple of God in Jerusalem 70 years before. He sent it all back home. 
And on top of that, he told everybody in, in Persia, formerly Babylon, that if they knew one of the captives who was returning home, that, that they were to give them gold and silver and, and a free will offering to help them pay to rebuild the temple. Now, that's just amazing to me that God would move in the heart of this pagan king to allow that. God is bigger than we sometimes think. And their return, of course, didn't happen overnight. Uh, I, I didn't mention this last week, but this return from exile didn't happen all at once either. It actually went in waves. There were three different waves of uh, returnees from exile. The first wave was led by Zerubbabel in uh, around 535 B.C., a second wave over a hundred years later was led by Ezra uh, around 460 B.C. And then the last one, the third one, was led by Nehemiah about 30 years after that. So we want to look this morning really at that first wave of exiles that the story is told in Ezra 1 through 6. The first six chapters of the book of Ezra. Led by Zerubbabel, he led about 50,000 exiles back to uh, Judea, back to Judah, and to, to Jerusalem. I'm going to pick up in chapter 3, though. We, we talked a little bit about chapter 1 uh, last, last week. Cyrus allows the exiles to return. Chapter 2 actually gives a pretty detailed listing of the folks who returned. God is faithful. God had promised that He would do it. And Ezra 2 just brings that home as they, as they did return home. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in, t in their towns, the people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. Here they come together as one, unified. And then Jeshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, according with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the people around them, they built the altar on its foundation, and they sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. So one of the first things they did, we see here, is to replace the altar, to rebuild the altar. You remember 70 years before when Nebuchadnezzar had sacked and destroyed Jerusalem, the temple was burned down. And in fact, Mark was reminding me this past week that is it this Sunday? This Sunday on the Jewish calendar is the day that the, both the first and the second temples were destroyed by foreign invaders. So, how about that? Um, great minds, kind of, isn't that something that we would be studying this story uh, during this season? But so, as the exiles returned, the first things they did, the first thing they did was to rebuild the altar. Why? Because that was the most important thing. The altar was where they brought sacrifices before God. It's where uh, to, to to atone for their sins. It was the place where they came for worship. And it looks like they, had, they played catch-up, as it goes on to say. They had a lot of catching up to do, celebrating not only, not only uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, and then it goes on to say, then the regular sacrifices, the new moon sacrifices, and then more of, uh, for all of the appointed sacred feasts of the Lord. They just went ahead and took care of it all. It had been a long time since they'd been able to do this in Jerusalem. And on top of that, in face of great fear, did you notice that in verse 3? There were many in Jerusalem who weren't all that thrilled with the Jews returning. Many of Judah's enemies were not happy about them being back. And that shows you just how important worship was to the people that they, in the face of this fear, would rebuild the altar. Well, the altar was just the first piece. Ultimately, they wanted to rebuild the temple, and the work on the temple began. Picking up in verse 8, in the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Josadak, and the rest of their brothers, the priests, 
and the Levites and all who had returned from the captivity to Jerusalem began the work, appointing Levites 20 years of age or older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Um, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their place to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love to Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It was this beautiful moment. Can you just imagine? It was quite an emotional moment. Just imagine being one of those exiles, one of those few exiles who had returned, but who remembered what the old temple had been like. Probably as young, very young people when that first temple had been destroyed. And now here they are, 70 years later, watching the temple foundation being relayed. Many of the older priests and Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. While many others shouted for joy. No one can distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. What a moment. What a moment that they have come home and the altar has been rebuilt. The temple foundation is being rebuilt. And they celebrated. But the celebration didn't last long though. Judah's frenemies, if you will, had already begun plotting against them. Notice how in chapter 4. Let's see. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families. And they said, let us help you build. Because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esaharadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Hmm. What do you think, guys? Can you, does that pass the smell test? Zerubbabel didn't think so. In fact, he responded by telling them that it was for... Judah, for the Jews to rebuild the temple and for them alone to rebuild it. Jumping down to verse 4, and the peoples around them set out, when that didn't work, then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and to make them afraid to go on building. I want you to notice how Judah's enemies were at work. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, all the way down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. You see, when they couldn't, when they couldn't weasel their way into quote-unquote helping, in other words, sabotaging the rebuilding efforts, when they couldn't weasel their way into that, they began a campaign of discouragement. Verse 4, they hired counselors, some translations say officials or agents. These agents got the king involved. Agents who were at work discouraging, actively discouraging the people. These agents got the king involved. They wrote a letter to Artaxerxes who was then ruling Persia after Cyrus, accusing the Jews of being a rebellious people. And so the king ordered a stop to the work. And in verse 24, the work, of, uh, the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. 
the work came to a screeching halt. And for years, that work stopped. For, for years, no more progress was made. The partially built structure stood on the mount reminding all of Judah of the unfinished work. Until chapter 5 tells us about Haggai. And Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Josedach, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Now don't you just love that? Haggai speaks. The work had stopped. Haggai comes and he speaks the word of the Lord. And all of a sudden, Zerubbabel and the gang are back rebuilding. Wouldn't you love to know what he said? Well, we do. In those verses that I read at the very beginning from the book of Haggai, we have Haggai's message to those former exiles who had been at work rebuilding the temple, but who had been discouraged and who had been frightened and who had stopped. You remember, right, what Haggai had said? Let me, let me put it back on the screen, this time from the message. I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. Listen to the words of Haggai in this paraphrased version. How is it... He said that it's the right time for you to live in your fine new homes while the home, God's temple, lay in ruins. Take a good hard look at your life. Think it over. You have spent a lot of money, but you haven't much to show for it. You keep filling your plates, but you never get filled up. You keep drinking and drinking and drinking, but you're always thirsty. You put on layer after layer of clothes, but you can't get warm. And the people who work for you, what are they getting out of it? Not much. A leaky, rusted out bucket, that's what. Take a good, hard look at your life. Think it over. Now, does that sound familiar? And I don't mean familiar like we just read it ten minutes ago. I mean familiar like the world around us. Does that sound anything like folks we know? Fear had caused them to stop the work of rebuilding. But they hadn't stopped sacrificing. They hadn't stopped giving their love and affection and allegiance to something. It was just that the object of that love and affection and allegiance had changed, right? That was the only thing that had changed. They had turned their attention from the temple onto themselves, right? That's what they had done. And Haggai helped them to see that. And man, they got back to rebuilding. They got back to rebuilding. Of course, that didn't stop the opposition and as you read on through the story, their enemies tried again to stop them, wrote another letter to the next king, Darius. Well, Darius had a, little, had a little mind to him. And he set about searching the archives, and he found the decree of Cyrus from those years before, giving permission, giving authorization for the exiles to return. And so he, bent, he, he sent back word to those government officials and those folks who were trying to frustrate the work. And he told them, he said, don't, you only, don't just let them rebuild. He says in verse 7, chapter 6 and verse 7, don't interfere with the work of the temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild the house of God on its site. Moreover, not only that, I hereby decree what you're to do for these elders of the Jews in the construction of their house of the God. The expenses of these men are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury. 
from the revenues of trans-Euphrates so that the work will not stop. This is from Darius, king of Persia. He said, not only let them rebuild, we're going to pay for it. Now, I just love that. There's a certain satisfaction that I get here watching God mess with government officials. I don't know if that's just me. God is God even over government bureaucracy. Amen? Maybe too many government people in here, right? God is God even over the bureaucracies of men. But then, finally, in 514 B.C., the work on the temple was finished. They finished building the temple, picking up midway through verse 14. According to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia, all those successive kings, the temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. You think he wants us to know that this thing happened for certain? Locating it so specifically in history. And of course, they celebrated in worship. On the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. The Passover. The celebration of the freedom from bondage in Egypt that they had been celebrating for generations since the time of Moses. Now, remembering their return from exile, deliverance from exile. Returning home. But I want you to see this morning, rebuilding the altar, rebuilding the temple, wasn't about reconstructing a building. That wasn't the, that wasn't the purpose. It was about restoring the priority of worship among the people of God. You see, you cannot restore God's people without restoring worship as that people's central and most important activity. And if we're concerned about restoration, we cannot rebuild or return to where we need to be if worship is not the most important thing we do. And I don't mean just coming to church Although that's essential, that's vital, that is the most obvious and visible manifestation of our worship when we come together on, sun, on the first day of the week to offer our worship. That's important, but worship is bigger than that. Worship is about ordering our lives around God. Worship is about saying to God, you are at the center of everything that I do. Not just number one uh, on a long list of other priorities or, or other things I like to do. No, God, you are central to everything I do. When I'm working, I'm working for you. When I'm playing, I'm playing to give you glory. You are central in all things. That's why the temple... That's why the temple was at the highest point in the middle of Jerusalem, at the middle of the, of the city, at the highest point to remind the people of God's priority in their life. It seems to me, look at the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. It seems to me that the real enemy of worship it wasn't government opposition. It wasn't even the atheists or pagans who, were, who didn't understand what they were doing. It's easy to blame those folks. The real enemy of worship was rather the self-centered, egocentric people who were too busy focusing upon themselves to recognize the Creator of the universe who had brought them out of exile. Did you notice what they were doing? Has anything changed in 2,500 years? Worship is important. Worship is important for a lot of reasons. Worship's important for a lot of reasons. God basks in the love and adoration and the genuine praise of His people, but, and, and God, uh, God wants worship but He doesn't need our worship 
like we need to worship. Worship is important because we need it. We need, we need to come before God in worship. Uh, quickly, three things this morning that worship reminds us of that are absolutely vital to restoration. Three things we need, three things worship reminds us of. It reminds us of who God is. When we come to worship, it puts all of our attention on God, the one who is worthy of our praise, the one who is worthy of our trust, the one who spoke into being all that we see around us, and the one who brought his people out of bondage and out of exile. And so when our focus is on God, you see, it can't be on us. Worship's not about us. Well, we often, we often try to make it about us. We try to make everything about us, don't we? But worship's about God. He is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. To borrow words from the Apostle, Acts 17, verse 28. We need to be reminded of that. Because if we don't, we tend to make life about us, don't we? I mean, let's be honest. We tend to make life about who can build the bigger houses, who can the biggest house, who can drive the fastest car, or who can wear the nicest clothes. That's what we tend to get consumed about, isn't it? And yet God wants for us to be consumed with Him. Worship reminds us of who God is. And that He is at the center of everything. Worship reminds us, secondly, who we are. You remember when Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, stood in the throne room of God in Isaiah chapter 6, and he beheld the, the glory and the majesty, the awesomeness of God. You remember what his first reaction was? He said, Woe is me. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Stepping into God's presence humbled Isaiah. And it reminded him of his own unworthiness and his sin. We need that. We need that. We need to be reminded of our sin. We need to be reminded of our weakness. Not so we'll walk out of here and think, oh, woe is me. But so that we'll walk out of here realizing our need for God. Only God can take away sin. God can do that. Only God can make us righteous before Him. We can't do it, we can't do that for ourselves as much as we sometimes try or fool ourselves into thinking that we can. We can't. Only God can do that. Only God. We need worship to remind us of that. We need worship to remind us of who we are and that we stand in need of a Savior. Because we've all sinned. and We've all fallen short. But finally, we need God to remind us of why we're all here. Why I'm here. What's the meaning of it all? I love what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12. He said, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Some translations say reasonable service. But the word that's translated there, spiritual act of worship, or reasonable service, in the Greek is a word letreuo. And it means literally spiritual service. It's about serving God uh, with, your, with, with our whole selves, with our, our whole lives, mind, body, 
spirit, heart, soul, or heart, strength, spirit, with our whole selves. Again, Eugene Peterson helps me here in the message. He paraphrases Paul. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. What does it mean to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God? Your ordinary life, whether you're sleeping or eating, whether you're working, playing, walking around, give it to God as an offering. He goes on to say, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. The transformed life results when we've offered God our whole life. Now this morning, does that describe your life? Does that describe you? Have you placed your life, your ordinary Eating, sleeping, walking around life? Have you placed that before God and said, Here it is, Lord. Here am I. Or, oh, like I've been so guilty of, turn, turn my attention on myself and my concerns instead of making God the central focus of my life. Mark's going to come and lead us in a, another song of worship. And as we all worship during the singing of this song, we encourage you, if, if you stand in need of prayer this morning, if you need to offer your life to God as a living sacrifice, you've never committed your life to Him, you've never surrendered your will in baptism, you've never asked for His forgiveness, we want to encourage you this morning to do so. How can we pray for you? How can we encourage you? Let's all stand together and worship. God, we thank you for bringing us uh, together this morning to, uh, to, to worship together and uh, build each other up and encourage each other. Uh, Father, you know our hearts, our minds, and uh, all the, the things that are going on in uh, our lives. Just help us to, uh, to, to, to focus on uh, you more uh, and, and us less and, and help uh, build and glorify uh, your kingdom, Father. Uh, please uh, do those at camp this week uh, and all the uh, adults and uh, kids that are that are there just have a, be a, just a great uh, a blessing and 
um, uh, just go with us throughout the, the, the rest of today um, and bring us back at the, the next time. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.